Hi, thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. Episode 2 Bronze Age Apocalypse 1177 BC. In the previous episode, we encountered various Bronze Age civilizations, such as Egypt and Mycenaean Greece, which thrived before 1000 BC. In this episode, we will meet the remaining major players of the late Bronze Age, and we will investigate why most of these civilizations were mysteriously destroyed at around the same time in the 12th century BC. Archaeologists have been debating what caused this destruction for over a century. Was it invaders? An earthquake storm? Famine and drought? Plague? Was it the mysterious sea peoples mentioned in the Egyptian sources as destroying everything in their path? With us here today to help solve this mystery is Eric Klein, archaeologist and ancient historian at the George Washington University and author of the award-winning book 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. In order to follow this dramatic and exciting story, here are a few important names and places you should be familiar with. There are basically three major powers in this time period besides the Mycenaeans. To the south of Greece, across the Mediterranean, you've got Egypt. To the east from Greece, across the Aegean Sea, you've got the mighty Hittite Empire in what is now Turkey. And to the southeast from there, in present-day Iraq, you've got Babylon and the Assyrian Empire. These three great powers, Egypt, the Hittites, and the Assyrians, form a triangle in the middle of which is a territory that they're often fighting over. This territory, present-day Lebanon, Israel, Syria, and Jordan, is referred to as Canaan or the Levant. These are the main names and places to know, and we'll explain the terms again as they come up in the episode. So let's get right to exploring this mystery with our guest, Eric Klein. Welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Thank you for having me on. That's quite a title, The Year Civilization Collapsed. Was 1177 BC really so cataclysmic? It was cataclysmic. That's one of the times when the Sea Peoples come sweeping in and fight the Egyptians. So it's one of the two basic dates we have for the collapse. What was lost during this uh, collapse and what was the overall impact on this area of the world? Well, what was lost was pretty much everything. Civilization. It was uh, the end of the world as they knew it back then and they didn't care. Or maybe they did. I think the only thing we can compare it to is the collapse of the Roman Empire, which happened 1500 years later, but the uh, impact was just as devastating. Basically civilized life as they knew it came to an end. They lost the art of writing, they lost the art of making big buildings. We get, you know, the Dark Ages that people talk about, the world's first Dark Ages. How long have you been interested in this uh, mystery of why all these civilizations collapsed? I have been interested in the collapse since I was a freshman in college. Freshman fall, I had Bronze Age archaeology from Jerry Rudder at Dartmouth. And then again, when I was at uh, Yale for my MA, I had a graduate level class this time on the uh, Bronze Age Aegean from Sarah Morris. And one of the questions on the final exam was on the collapse of the Bronze Age. So in fact, I just gave a, a lecture on 1177 BC at the Getty Villa in LA. And Sarah Morris was there. So uh, before I began the lecture, I pointed her out and I said, this was a question I was asked in graduate school. So Sarah, 30 years later, I hope you like my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to finally tackle the, the question in a book? Well, actually, it came about in a couple of different ways, but I'll, I'll make a long story short. Rob Tempio of Princeton University Press came to see me in, it was 2007 or 2008, and he said to me that uh, he wanted me to write a book on the end of the Bronze Age. And I said, I'd be happy to do that, but there's much more to the story. That it's not just how it collapsed or why it collapsed, but for me, the interesting thing is, as well as uh, what collapsed. Uh, 
So how about if I begin and end the book with the collapse, and who are the sea peoples and all that? But in the middle part, I tell the story of the Late Bronze Age, and uh, 15th century, 14th century, 13th century. Who are the Mycenaeans? Who are the Minoans? Who are the Hittites? Who are the Cypriots, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians? You know, the G8 or G9 of the ancient world. Uh, and basically give the entire backstory <clears throat> so that when I come back at the end uh, of the book in the concluding chapters, the audience, the readers, are now familiar with what collapsed and are able to grasp the immensity, uh, the enormity of what the collapse meant. For some of our listeners that are not experts in ancient history, what do we mean by the Bronze Age and why is it called the Bronze Age? Well, uh, it's actually a tricky question because the Bronze Age is different depending on where you are in the world. The Bronze Age in the Western Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and Near East is basically 3000 BC to 1000 BC, give or take. The period that we're concerned with here is the Late Bronze Age, which would be about 1700 down to a little after 1200. Things keep trickling on to, say, 1000 BC or so, at which point we get the Iron Age, because iron replaces bronze as the um, majority metal. So for most of the late Bronze Age, bronze is still the hardest material available, right? Yeah, it's the best and the hardest. I mean, it's, you have to figure out how to, how to make it. You know, it's 90% copper, 10% tin. The problem is, where do the metals come from? Uh, the copper is pretty easy. That's going to be coming from Cyprus. I mean, Kypros is where we get the name for the island in copper. Um, tin could come from a number of places. Um, everybody thinks of Cornwall, and it, maybe the Mycenaeans are going up there. But the vast majority of the tin is going to be coming from what we would today call Afghanistan. Wow. So Cyprus is kind of in a way, the epicenter of this, uh, or it's close to the center of this area of civilizations, if Egypt to the south, Mesopotamia to the east, Hittites to the north, and the Mycenaeans to the west. So that's an abundant resource. But tin is then the is the precious metal that you need to, to um, get from thousands of miles away. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, the equivalent, uh, Carol Bell in England has said the equivalent is oil for us today. And I think that's very, very true. So she pointed out that um, trying to get tin in the ancient uh, Near East and the Aegean and the Bronze Age would have kind of been at the heart of what the king of the Hittites would have wanted and the king in Egypt, just like oil for an American president today. And I think it's a very good analogy because if you don't have tin back then, you don't have bronze, just like if you don't have oil today, you don't have gasoline. So when the tin source gets cut off, which is in part what I think happens at the end of the Late Bronze Age, I think that's going to be one of the stressors that leads to the collapse of everything when they can't get their tin anymore. The interconnected and um, cosmopolitan world that you bring to life in your book is really exciting, and it makes the collapse all the more dramatic. But now that we know approximately what the crime scene is, let us just backtrack a little bit and set the stage. Mm -hmm. And since this is a podcast on ancient Greece, why don't we start with the Mycenaean world? What was the Mycenaean world like? I mean, was it like <laughs> what Homer tells us? Uh, these powerful kings uh, in Pylos and Mycenae and Sparta, each ruling over their own area from a nice palace, or what was it like? Well, we can't be sure, of course. I mean, we do have what Homer has said, but we need to take that with a grain of salt because he's writing so many hundreds of years later. We have lots of archaeology, and we even have textual evidence from Linear B, but that's mostly economic texts. So near as we can figure out, yeah, they were basically living in what we might call city-states, where you've got Mycenae, Pylos, Tiryns, or Komenos, uh, and the areas around them that they ruled. Uh, agricultural based for the most part. Toss in some international trade because you're going to need some of your raw materials. You're going to need to import your gold, most of your copper, all of your tin. So uh, along with the raw materials, I think they're also importing finished goods and things like the Ulubru and Shipwreck indicate that. And uh, along with that, I think, can't prove it, but I think ideas came as well. You know, way back when, before I was uh, starting my dissertation and all that, everybody was 
still arguing about whether there was contact, whether there was trade. There's no longer any question. They, they know, we know, Bronze Age Greece is in contact with Egypt and the Near East. So now the question is not were they in contact, but how much were they in contact? And not did they import things, but what else came along with the imported goods? So I think we're now fairly comfortable with the idea that this is globalized, if you want to call it that. I hesitate to use that loaded term, but I do use it in the book. And I do think they were globalized for that time period, you know, within the range from Italy to Afghanistan and Turkey down to Egypt. They're all interconnected. <clears throat> They're all um, dependent on each other. Uh, and they are all interacting, and that's the way I see globalization working today, as just as it did back then. You mentioned briefly the Uluburun shipwreck, and that was one of many really exciting parts of your book. And I think what's exciting about it is that it's this perfectly preserved time capsule, right? And it's not just a time capsule, it's like the best possible time capsule you could hope for. So could you say a little bit about what the shipwreck tells us what it is and so forth. Yeah, the Uluburun shipwreck, which is off the coast of Turkey uh, at a place called Uluburun, uh, went down at about <clears throat> 1300 BC, give or take. It is a microcosm of the trade and contacts that were going on back then. It turns out to have uh, goods, cargo, from seven different civilizations at least, you know, maybe even eight. But there's stuff on board from Egypt, from Nubia, from um, Assyria and Babylon, Mycenaeans, Minoans, Hittites, Cypriots. So for me, the story of the Uluburun shipwreck is the story of the international connections of the Late Bronze Age. And it, it really does encapsulate it. It, um, it was unfortunate for the people on board the ship, but very fortunate for us. There was an article on um ancient shipwrecks recently that I read that said that most shipwrecks just contain salt and fish sauce. <laughs> so this is quite a, an exquisite shipwreck. The, this is an amazing shipwreck. The problem is that we don't really know uh, where it's coming from or where it's going to. We don't know who sent it uh, or anything about that because uh, there's no writing on board the ship. There are two wooden diptychs that should have contained writing at some point, but the wax is gone and with it the writing. So the thinking is that it was on its way to the Aegean with this load of goods, both finished goods and raw materials, and that it would have there, whether it was Knossos or Mycenae or Pylos, would have then exchanged those goods for Mycenaean and Minoan stuff and brought them back to Egypt and the Near East. There's also no real guarantee actually what nationality it is. Uh, Bass and Jamal Pulik think it uh, is probably Canaanite, but they have also shown there's evidence for at least two Mycenaeans on board. Perhaps we should quickly review a few of these terms, like the Aegean is the sea uh, where all the Greek islands are. You know. Right, so when I say the Aegean, I'm usually just referring, it's a shorthand, to mainland Greece, Crete, and the Cycladic Islands. Uh, Minoans are on Crete. They've got the major city at, at Knossos, but with other palaces as well. And then um, on mainland Greece, you've got these that I've been naming, Mycenae, Terence, Pylos, or Komenos, right? Um, Canaan, yes, also known as the Levant, which would be modern Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Um, Cyprus is Cyprus. Um, the Hittites and Hatti are gonna be up in what is now Turkey, and then the Egyptians are in Egypt. Assyria and Babylonia are in what is today um, northern Syria and Iraq. So back to Greece a little bit. Um, so you mentioned that the um, Linear B tablets found in the Greek world at this time are mainly lists uh, for administrative purposes. But it's also clear from the story that you present in your book that uh, the major powers in this time period are sending letters to each other, right? And we, one of the really surprising things in your book was the letter from a Mycenaean king to the Hittite king. And... It's written in Akkadian, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what? Uh, how did these various heads of state um, communicate with each other? What was the language they used, and what was the the way of sending letters? Well, those are all loaded questions, and uh, you may get different answers from different people. But the way I understand it is that, uh, in addition to whatever language they may have spoken and written back home, 
each of the major powers would have employed Akkadian as the lingua franca, the diplomatic language of the day, much like Benjamin Franklin used French in his day. And where is Akkadian from originally? Now, Akkadian is, it's cuneiform, first of all, right? Cuneiform meaning wedge-shaped. So Akkadian, or sometimes Babylonian, would have been used by the Assyrians and the Babylonians uh, as their primary language. But we also find the Egyptians writing in Akkadian, we find the Hittites writing in Akkadian. Uh, and now, if this um, identification is correct, perhaps a Mycenaean king writing in Akkadian also, or at least it being translated into Akkadian. So each of these civilizations had their own native writing system, but when they actually engaged in international communication, they would they would use this international language of Akkadian. Yes, but that brings up a problem for me as I investigated in an, art an article a while ago. Where are the letters that were sent from Egypt, from the Hittites, from the Canaanites, from the Cypriots, to the Mycenaean rulers? Where are they? We don't have any of them. We don't have any foreign archives or letters at Mycenae. We don't have any at Pylos, none at Terence, none at Knossos. Whereas we do have such letters in Egypt, for example, and at Ugarit in North Syria. So if the Mycenaeans are in fact in contact with the Near East, as I think they are, we are lacking the written evidence both in Greece and elsewhere. So for instance, in the Amarna archive, which is a set of letters uh, that, was writ that were written by or sent to Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, there are letters sent to the Egyptian king from everybody except the Mycenaeans and Minoans. We have letters from the Hittites, Assyrians, Babylonians, Cypriots, Canaanites. No letters from the Mycenaeans, no letters from the Minoans. Why not? Now it's possible our people in Greece are not writing to them, um, or, or what? Maybe they're writing on perishable materials. Maybe they're writing on papyrus, which is gone. Or sending messages on wooden diptychs, which are gone. But for me, this is the mystery. Where are the foreign archives at Mycenae? If I'm correct, and if, if others are correct about the extent of the um, connections and, and trade, there should also be written things that document it, but there aren't. Now, of course, excavations are still ongoing at all of these sites, including Mycenae, and all it takes is a discovery next year to, uh, to change everything. But for right now, there is what I would say the case of the missing letter. I see it as kind of a Sherlock Holmes mystery. Yeah, that is truly a mystery because um, if this new hypothesis is true that the letter found in the Hittite archive, if that's really a letter to the uh, Achaeans or Ahiyawa, uh, then there must have been letters actually sent there and then you wonder where do they go? And yes, you would think so. I um, it is probably a letter from the king of Ahiyawa, which makes it extremely interesting. I mean, the whole Ahiyawa question is another fascinating question. Like, like I say, I think Ahiyawa are the Achaeans. I don't think there's anything else they can be. And then you get onto all sorts of interesting things because we know that the Ahiyawans were involved in some uh, wars or rebellions uh, involving Wilusa in northwestern Turkey. And Wilusa, I think, is probably Wilios, Ilios, Troy, in which case we may have um, some circumstantial evidence that the Mycenaeans are involved in a war such as the Trojan War would be that Homer wrote about. So I think, uh, again, that there's a kernel of truth at the very least at the basis of what Homer says. So I actually think the Trojan War is part and parcel of the collapse as a whole, and that's the context in which it needs to be seen. So Homer, um, he never calls the Greeks Greeks. That's that's a, a much later term. He doesn't call them Hellenes either. He calls them Achaeans and Argives and Danaoi. Right. And uh, there's a lot of interesting data points that you bring up in your book, like the Egyptians call the Greeks, uh, what they call mainland Greece, like Tanai or something? Tanaya, exactly. Tanaya which sounds like Danaoi. Right? right, exactly. Yeah, there's a, um, a statue base in Egypt uh, that Amenhotep III put up. Uh, he's going to reign from about 1391 to 1353 or so, the first half of the 14th century BC. 
Uh, for those who don't know him, he's the father of the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten, the man who may have invented monotheism. But he also has this statue base in his mortuary temple at Komel Khatan, which mentions places in what must be the Aegean. And by must be, I mean Mycenae, Knossos, Naphtheon, Kithra. These are names that have never been seen in Egypt before, and they're never seen again. But on this one statue base, Amenhotep lists them, and they've got to be, uh, you know, names and places uh, from the Minoans and Mycenaeans, and they knew the names of the cities. So they must have been, at least in my opinion, in fairly close contact at that time. About a century after Amenhotep, it seems that the that people all over the Eastern Mediterranean start getting a little nervous about whatever's happening. The Mycenaeans start building fortifications. Um, what else starts happening to suggest that maybe troubles are arising? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, so about 100 years after A3, Anakonaten, round about, say, 1250 B.C., the Mycenaeans do seem to be getting nervous. Now, of course, that's an extrapolation on our part, but that's when, for instance, at Mycenae, we get um, the city walls expanded, uh, the Lion Gate goes up, they also build the tunnels, underwater tunnels, down to the water supply. Uh, expansions happen at Tiryns and various other places. Uh, and the, the water tunnels would be to ensure access to water in, in the event of a siege? Absolutely, so you don't have to go outside the walls to get your water. And we've seen this already in the Near East. In fact, the Hittites do it too in Turkey. So the question that we've got is, why, why then? What has them worried? that they're starting to build these um, very defensive positions at that time. And um, I suspect that things had started to go south already by that point and that they were justifiably nervous and were preparing for, um, you know, Armageddon, the apocalypse, zombie apocalypse, whatever you have you. <laughs> I think uh, that's what was coming their way and they knew it. And within a another 100 years, all of the major Mycenaean palaces, the palaces in Crete and Ugarit in the Middle East and Hattusa, the capital of the Hittites, all these places were destroyed. Yeah, by within 100 years, maybe a little bit more when you add everything in, let's say by 1100 BC, everything as they knew it was gone. Everything had, had collapsed. The, the ruling elite, the 1%, they're gone. The, the writing is gone, all of that. Um, and you get the, the Dark Ages, as it were. So um, the way I, I phrased it in the book is that life in 1200 BC was very different from life in 1100 BC and completely different from life in 1000 BC. Because what we're looking at really, to put it very simply, and um, as Colin Renfrew would have called it already back in the 70s, we're looking at a systems collapse. And a systems collapse can take up to a century to take place from start to finish. But in the end, your um, centralized economy goes away. The, um, all the, the good stuff from civilization is lost. You've got population movements. You know, you've got all these hallmarks uh, of uh, what we would call a systems collapse. And that's all going on, not only in Greece at this time, but also in Egypt and across the Near East. And uh, it will take at least 150 years and as much as 300 years in some areas to, to climb back out of it, climb back out of the Dark Ages, as, as we call it. We'll talk a bit more about systems collapse in a bit, but I'd like to ask you, as an archaeologist, when you excavate um, you know, an ancient city like Mycenae or Knossos or Hattusa or Ugarit, and you know, under like five other cities you find the late Bronze Age city, how do you know it's destroyed by warfare and not by earthquake i mean what what is the what's the process there of understanding well that can be very very tough to figure out to an archaeologist frequently uh, a city destroyed by say an earthquake can look the same as a city destroyed by humans especially if the end result is a fire that guts the entire city so um, in both you may have walls that are tossed down especially if you've got people using things like battering rams or siege engines um, both of which are probably being used already in the bronze age so then you've got a problem who destroyed it mother nature or humans uh, 
in cases where you've got, say, arrowheads embedded in the walls or arrowheads embedded in the skeletons, uh, it's pretty obvious that it was humans. So, for instance, at Hut at um, Ugarit, uh, the city that's destroyed in the 1180s, uh, not only do you have ash heaped up for a couple of meters, but you've also got arrowheads embedded in the walls. And so I think it's fairly clear that the final days of Ugarit were caused by human invaders. Now, which human invaders? That's another question entirely, but I think it is human. It's not as crystal clear at other places. So, for example, at Mycenae and at Tiryns, I think the destructions there are caused by earthquakes. And other people like Klaus Killian, who dug it at Tiryns, have said the same thing. Usually when you find a destroyed city from this time period, people say, aha, it's the Sea Peoples. And they've been blaming the Sea Peoples since you know, 1901 or even earlier, since Gaston Maspero, the French Egyptologist, first suggested this scenario. He had no evidence for it. He just said, ah, the Egyptians write about these Sea Peoples, and they destroyed everything. And so Gaston Maspero said, everywhere you find a destroyed city at this time, it's the Sea Peoples. And people have stuck to that. But that's not necessarily true. I think a lot of the destructions that we've uh, kind of naively attributed to the Sea Peoples is not actually their fault. And I think they're, in a lot of cases, just as much the victims as they were the oppressors. Well, now that we've mentioned the Sea Peoples a few times, and uh, they're probably the most popular scapegoat for this civilizational collapse. So how do we get this label? And um, what happened in Egypt specifically that that we get this term from? So the Sea Peoples, first of all, that's our name for them. The Egyptians do not call them the Sea Peoples. What the Egyptians do say is uh, that people of specific name, and they actually tell us nine different groups that came over the course of two separate invasions that are separated by 30 years. So the first invasion came in the year 1207 BC, in the time of Merneptah. Now, 30 years later, some of them come again with some new groups and minus a couple old groups in 1177 BC, in the time of Ramses III. So all told, we've got the people like the Shurdan or Shardana, the Shekelesh, the Ekwesh, the Weshesh, the Teresh, the um, Denyan, uh, and the Peleset. So I think I'm close to nine there. The problem is that we're hard pressed to identify most of them. We don't know where they come from, and we don't know where they go to. Now we can guess. People have been playing linguistic guessing games. And in fact, the very first person to guess was Champollion, the guy who deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphics. He had already said that the Peleset were probably the Philistines, and that's the only identification that is stuck. Uh, so some people think that the Shardana come from Sardinia, the Shekelesh come from Sicily, but you know, where do the Weshesh come from? Where do the Teresh come from? As they come, and the Egyptians tell us this, specifically Ramses III, on the wall of his temple at Medinet Habu, he's got a picture of the naval battle that he fought against the Sea People, and he's got a written inscription. And he says that they overran Hatti, and they overran um, Alashia, which is Cyprus. They overran Artsawa in uh, western Anatolia, and they set up a camp in Amuru, which is northern Syria. So he actually describes the route that they came, and then he says, they came down to Egypt and I fought a land battle and a sea battle against them. Uh, and so, according to him at least, we know exactly what happened. The Egyptians beat them both times in 1207 and 1177, but at least the second time it's a Pyrrhic victory. Egypt's never the same again. So let's consider a few of these names of the various so-called sea peoples that Merneptah and Ramses III give us. They have striking similarity to a lot of more familiar toponyms, as you mentioned. So Sherdana sounds kind of like Sardinia, and uh, Luca sounds like Lucia. In well, Sicily. Luca is definitely Lycia. Okay, absolutely. So that's southwestern. That's southwestern Turkey. Turkey. Yes. Teresh sounds like the Tercinians or Etruscans, of the Greeks called the Etruscans Tercinians. Yes, yes, or possibly people from the Troad, sure. <clears throat> could be either place. 
Denian or Danuna sounds like Danaoi, the Homeric Greeks. Tejeker sounds kind of like Teucrians, right? Maybe. Possibly, though. Some people have said that might be just another way of spelling sickle. But, yeah, okay. yeah, but possibly. Peluset, as you said, could be the Philistines. Right, the Peluset or the, probably the Philistines, yes. Could that be the same people as the Pelasgoi mentioned in... People have argued that. Okay. People have argued that. And then Weshesh might be Ikeans, who knows? Maybe. We're not sure. They usually refer to them as the shadowy Weshesh. I see. But then you've got the Ekwesh, who are probably the Ikeans, if anything. So this might be an alliance of very different peoples, right? Yeah, an alliance would be one way to put it. The other way that uh, that you could put it and that people have suggested is that as an initial group of invaders is sweeping across and knocking off various civilizations, that some of the survivors of those civilizations then join in. So the way I've always um, explained it to my students and, and to myself for that matter, is that what we're seeing in Egypt and what gets recorded in the Egyptian inscriptions is the final wave that crashes upon Egypt and that not all of those groups might have been present at the beginning of the migration, but they are present at the end. And it is definitely a migration because uh, Ramses III shows us that these are not like Viking warriors. They are traveling with their women, their children, their household belongings. I would um, liken it to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s here in the United States where you've got the uh, people from Oklahoma moving to Texas and California. Uh, it's a migration, plain and simple. And uh, as such, these are people looking for a new place to live. Uh, and in fact, that may be where the Philistines come on in because Philistine material looks like degenerate Mycenaean, as, as we would call it. It looks like Mycenaean pottery, but now it's made using clay that's from Rhodes or Cyprus or even in Israel. And so it looks like your Mycenaeans are now living in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Is there any um, evidence that the Mycenaean world was more damaged by the Sea Peoples as opposed to being part of the Sea Peoples and, and actually causing damage to other civilizations? Well, this is part of the problem that we've got because the, the honest and simple answer is we don't know. We don't know for sure. Um, I alluded earlier to destructions at Mycenae and Tyrians, for example, that seem to be caused by earthquakes rather than by people. But regardless, no matter how your cities are destroyed, the fact that they are destroyed, and if you put like a drought on top of that, then your lower level people, the 99%, they're going to start moving. They're going to be looking for new lands, new places to, to farm. Um, a new way of life. So uh, I do think that we've probably got some Mycenaeans on the move here, but uh, exactly what triggered it uh, is still up for debate. And that's in fact why, you know, spoiler alert, at the end of the book, I don't come to any real conclusion because we can't yet. It's too early. What I was presenting is the state, the current state of our knowledge. And the current state says that there may have been multiple reasons for the collapse, among which would number invaders, earthquakes, drought, famine, and so on. So I actually called it a, a perfect storm, which is what I think happened, that you can survive one, you can survive a drought, right? Not everybody will, but same thing with the famine. Some people will die, others will survive. Earthquake, invaders, all of these things not everybody's going to die. You don't collapse a civilization because of a drought. But what if you've got a drought and a famine and invaders and everything else all at the same time? And we actually have a great example of how civilizations can recover from tremendous stresses uh, in the eruption of the Santorini volcano in the 16th century BC. So that's actually uh, possibly the, the most violent volcanic eruption known in human history. And and yet, and it, that would have sunk every ship within 
hundreds of miles, right? It would have completely... <laughs> if they got caught in the tidal wave that went with it, yes, probably. And yet that doesn't seem to have really disrupted Aegean civilization much. Well, it may or may not have. Did it impact the Minoans? Well, that's what a lot of people thought. In fact, originally the idea was that the eruption of Santorini is what brought the Minoans down and allowed the Mycenaeans to invade Crete. Um, now that's no longer the thinking. Um, it definitely did impact the Minoans, but maybe not lastingly. Uh, and so it's one of these natural um, catastrophes that, as you said, people survived, right? They went on. However, by 1200 BC, something happened to this, as you call it, globalized cosmopolitan world that made it so i guess interdependent and integrated that it was a it became a more fragile system i do think that that may be the case to a certain extent when santorini erupted the world of the aegean and, and eastern mediterranean was not as globalized at that time say in the 17th century there are connections of course i mean you've got aegean style wall paintings at daba in egypt and even at the site that i'm excavating now with the Safios Orlando and Andrew Co. Cabri in Israel. So there is some contact, but not to the extent that there will be later in the Bronze Age. So even if the eruption of Santorini impacted everybody, as it may well have, you know, from uh, Crete to Egypt to Cyprus to the Near East to, to Turkey, uh, they were more resilient, perhaps, um, less interconnected, and so able to bounce back more. Your book is quite unusual among uh, books by academic historians in that you do draw analogies between the far past and the present. Um, I didn't actually start out intending to do that. When I started writing the book, I was simply writing about the late Bronze Age. It was only because events were taking place in today's world as I was writing it where I started seeing parallels and I suddenly went, whoa, <laughs> maybe there's something to be said here. Maybe we're closer to them back then than we think we are. So by the time I finished writing it, yes, I had a whole set of uh, parallels or analogies which I hadn't intended to start with. I'd like to read the first paragraph of your preface. The economy of Greece is in shambles. Internal rebellions have engulfed Libya, Syria, and Egypt, with outsiders and foreign warriors fanning the flames. Turkey fears it will become involved, as does Israel. Jordan is crowded with refugees. Iran is bellicose and threatening, while Iraq is in turmoil. AD 2013? Yes, but it was also the situation in 1177 BC. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, thank you. It's a, I thought it was a good way to open the book, you know. But all of those things, or most of those things that I referred to in that opening paragraph, transpired between, say, 2007 and 2013. Interestingly, and also, you know, sadly, things have continued. This book came out before the huge wave of refugees before everybody washing up on the shores of Lesbos, before, um, well, I mean, the Syrian war is still ongoing, but there's now evidence, for example, that actually cited in the new afterward to the paperback that the Syrian civil war has its origins in a drought that's from like 2006. So um, unfortunately, I would say, the parallels to today continue. And I think now, for example, uh, if we were to talk about the Sea Peoples now and then, like uh, I actually end my lecture saying, you know, look, we've had all these things now and they had all these things then. Uh, in fact, I think the only thing we're missing today are the Sea Peoples, and it usually gets a laugh. I've changed that because I do think we've got the Sea Peoples now. The question is, who are they? Because from one instance, ISIS, are the Sea Peoples, right? Destroying everything in their path, no sense of antiquity, in fact, destroying it deliberately. So on the one hand, you could say that ISIS is the Sea Peoples. On the other hand, you could say that the wave of refugees that has been created by the Syrian civil war and ISIS that's flooding into Europe 
that those are the sea peoples. They're peaceful for now, but what if they turned violent? Then you'd have the same thing. So now my question is not do we have a modern, uh, a modern instance or example of the sea peoples. I think we do. The question is who are they? Is it ISIS or is it the refugees? Or are they both different types of sea peoples? So um, I think one could expand the opening even more and that if it came out now, it would be almost even more dramatic. But um, one could almost be accused then of um, pandering, you know, that, that you're just trying to sell books. Like, no, uh, in my case, I was not just trying to sell books. I thought it was very interesting to note the differences and to say, um, in a nutshell, every civilization in the history of humanity has collapsed so far. Why would we think that we are immune? We're going to collapse too. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and, and how and why. Again, I'm at great pains to say, look, I'm not a chicken little running around saying, oh my God, the sky is falling. I'm simply saying, those guys collapsed. We have a lot of the same thing today, but there are differences, right? We've got technology now. We're aware of what's happening. Uh, I don't think an ancient Hittite knew what was happening. So why don't we end with... Um the answer that you do offer at the end of the book involving systems collapse. So if I understand the gist of it correctly, we've gone through these various scapegoats and factors. You have invasions, migrations, earthquakes, droughts, climate change, all of these can be detected archeologically, but they're also present in many time periods where you don't find such collapse. So it seems that there are certain time periods where various civilizations become so interconnected, so interdependent and integrated that the overall system becomes in a way fragile. And then when that is hit with a combination of population pressure, migration, warfare, plague, earthquakes and so forth, that system can no longer withstand it and you have a collapse of the whole thing. Is that is that the general gist of it? Yeah, you get a tipping point. Absolutely. Right. So one of the things that I, I say uh, at the beginning of the book and also in my lecture is that, you know, studying collapse is not new, right? There, Edward Gibbon did it for, for Rome. And then, you know, Jared Diamond, of course, wrote an entire book on collapse. The, the difference with um, most of those and, and this one is that in those cases, they were investigating the collapse of a single civilization, the Romans, the Maya, you know, whatever. Uh, in this particular case, back in late Bronze Age and us today, we've got interconnected civilizations. And in the case of the late Bronze Age, everything goes down at once. And that, as far as I can tell, is the only instance in history where we've got such a, uh, such a, a circumstance. So, um, that for me, again, is kind of a parallel to today because I don't see many other times in history when you have as interconnected, as globalized a society as we have today and have had for the last couple of hundred years. So I do think that it's um, relevant to talk about it. And I also think that something like a systems collapse is probably the best way uh, to talk about it. If you get one little thing going wrong in one civilization, it could have a ripple effect that um, affects all the other civilizations here. And then you frequently get um, a multiplier effect added in there, where something that you could survive on its own, the effects are multiplied because of other things as well. And so that's where I think the earthquakes and the famine and the drought and the invaders uh, comes in. And, and as I say, you could survive one maybe two of those, maybe even three of those. But when the fourth one hits, I'm sorry, you're dead. The one thing that I don't see yet that I'm waiting to, that I, I think we will get evidence for, but we don't have it yet, I don't see infectious disease playing a role in the end of the late Bronze Age yet. Uh, we definitely have the Hittites and Shupiluliuma, my favorite name in ancient world, Shupiluliuma the first in about you know, 1350 BC, the time of the Amarna letters. Um, they do have a plague that goes through the Hittite uh, world, but that's 150 years before the end. So I don't think that's one of the contributing factors. But in a world that is so devastated by um, everything else, 
I would have thought that they would have had infectious diseases, cholera, typhoid, you know, running rampant. And yet, so far, not only don't we have any mass graves anywhere, but um, more importantly for me is we don't have any written evidence. What about the first page of the Iliad, which does describe a plague where Apollo is shooting his shafts, which is a metaphor for the plague spreading in the army. Uh, yeah, well, there again, you're you're reaching down to Homer, which is you know always semi dangerous to do for the Bronze Age. But it may be that that's the only thing that you know that we've got so far, or this kind of what I would say circumstantial and possible evidence. But um, for me, what I want, and it's not going to take much. You know, just like the Philistine Cemetery was just announced at Ashkelon, uh, I, I want uh, another cemetery uh, dating to 1200 BC or just afterward with mass grave, uh, with, uh, a, a mass grave with um, massive bodies, which uh, all died at the same time with no weapons, no arrowheads, no spears whatever. And of course, with our scientific analyses today, we can tell if they had malaria or other things. And so we may be able to tell what they died from there as well. I think if we get that, that again will not be the smoking gun, but it will be one to mix metaphors, one more arrow in our um, quiver. So um, all I know is that uh, I would have loved to have lived back in the late Bronze Age. Uh, and I usually say that I probably wouldn't have survived more than 24 or 48 hours had I done so. But uh, certainly if I were living at the end of the late Bronze Age, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have been alive for more than about six hours or so. But it would be fascinating six hours. So one of these days. Well, perhaps one final point uh, we should uh, touch on is just how difficult it is to put together a historical narrative from archaeological evidence, right? I mean, um, tell me what you think of this metaphor, but in a way, like your simile, what you're doing is like trying to reconstruct a Hitchcock movie based on only a list of characters, maybe a few pages of the screenplay and a few screenshots. Yes, that would that would absolutely work. Um, I would, uh, I actually made a, a similar uh, thing in the book where I compared it to an Agatha Christie novel and her co Poirot trying to put everything together. These are definitely, you know, these are mysteries and we are detectives. That's what archaeologists and ancient historians are. We're trying to piece things together. And I think in part that is what attracts people to archaeology and ancient history in particular is that you're trying to not only recreate the the world that came before us and civilizations that uh, preceded ours. But uh, uh, it's a mystery and uh, you're trying to solve it, which is uh, a wonderful intellectual exercise. Eric Klein, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. At this point, I'd like to invite our listeners to visit the webpage for this episode at greasepodcast.com slash two. That's number two for episode two where we've set up a poll and you can vote. Do you think our civilization could potentially collapse in the future? And could the study of history be useful in preventing such a collapse? In addition to voting, please join the conversation in the comments section. If you'd like to know more about the detective work that went into some of the claims discussed today, check out the book, 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. If you can, support your local bookstore. Thanks for listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Can you still sing Orpheus and sing something that's going to last? A thousand years slips by so fast, goes off into a dusty myth with you.